If you think corporations bought free speech before Now that they're human, they'll buy even more Yeah, their money has free speech to live by too Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, The Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. The mission of the Alliance for Democracy and our Populist Dialogues program is to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. Today our guests are Jim Robinson and Robin Pants. Uh, Jim is the chair of the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group and Robin is the St. John's neighborhood representative to that organization. So welcome to both of you to the program. David, Thank you. thanks for having us. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have a rather large uh, Superfund site in Portland, and it uh, it involves the Willamette River. Talk about talk about um, what qualified that area to be a Superfund. Well, it's, there was an investigation in the late '90s that was uh, funded through DEQ and actually with the cooperation of EPA to determine pollutant levels in the Willamette River, and from that it was listed, the conclusions from that led to being listed as a Superfund site with the EPA. Um, that then started this whole process. A lot of us in the community started getting involved in around the year 2000 when it was listed and we've been watching this process as it goes forward. And it's been a long process because there's a lot of studying that has to happen of the river, determining what pollutants there are, where they are, what the risks are to human health and ecological health from those pollutants and then coming up with methods for how it can be cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a long process. Okay. Yeah, the, the, long, the process actually, you know, the, our river back from the 1880s, we first started really seeing development through a uh, humongous use of fish wheels on the river. We've seen depleted stocks, we've seen pollution come and go, you know, we saw the atomic call air. So to get here where we're at now has been a long time really in the making, not just within the last uh, 20 years of really highlighting it, but it's been focused over decades and a century of, you know, of issues that has to do mm -hmm. with development of the city. And it's really reflective yeah. of our community and an impact on local cultures and stuff. So it's more than just cleaning up the river. It's a lot of history there, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I'll just comment for those people watching or not, in from Portland, uh, the Willamette River runs through the heart of downtown Portland, uh, going north, flowing into the Columbia River, and then the Columbia River itself dumps, dumps, flows into the uh, Pacific Ocean. So that's just the ge geography of that. Well, the, the build upon that a little bit, if I can digress a little bit, mm -hmm. David, is for those people who aren't from the Northwest, the Willamette River is one of the few rivers that actually flows north in North hemisphere so it's it's a very unique river too mm -hmm. not only uh, important to us mm -hmm. here in Portland but I think to uh, uh, geographic worldwide yeah I'm glad to hear right. you say that I've, I've actually heard that before but I uh, have never been never actually looked at the map to, to see but you know at least uh, in this part of the world we would normally expect rivers to be running to the west not to the north right yeah <laughs> an important point about some of the history that Robin mentioned is that when we look at the pollutants that are in the river now, a lot of those pollutants have been there for 60, 80, 100 years. So we're dealing with stuff that has been in there for many decades and it's not going away. And that's why the Superfund process is there, is to try to clean up those pollutants that are persistent. Okay. And why not just leave them alone? Well, they're damaging the ecosystem right now. Uh, we have fewer fish, we have fewer, uh, ben the, the benthic life is yeah. injured, which gets up into the whole food chain. It does cause uh, injury to the wildlife that are in the area, the, not only the fish, the birds, the mammals that are along shore, but it also then affects human health because those fish at the bottom of the river that are eating some of the pollu polluted contaminants that are on the, on the bottom of the river, in the sediment coming from the sediment there those fish are being caught by people and, and who are eating them mm -hmm. and so as an example i i sent you a chart there's a mm -hmm. pcbs in the portland harbor and on that chart it compares some of the pcb levels in various fish 
that are in the river. The largest peak is in carp. Now on this chart, there is a line very close to the bottom that says 10 parts per billion. That is the level at which EPA considers it to be of concern. Then there's a line slightly above that says 47 ppb. That's where the Oregon Department of Health says that is a level at which we need to warn people, caution people not to eat those fish. Mm -hmm. Most of the fish are well above that 47 and carp is wow. up at around 2800. Now for, for the people that can't see this chart, they can go to the EPA website and find this information. For us it would be the region 10, which uh -huh. is the northwest region, or they can go to, uh, to the lower Lambert Group site or even to our website, which is? PortlandHarborCag.info. Okay, right, yeah. And I, I, this, this chart will go up on screen wh mm -hmm. when you're talking about okay. it. Okay. Right. And okay. one thing to remember about the risk to human health, what the studies have found that have been done on the river is that the biggest risk is to babies, infants, because this is a kind of contaminant that accumulates in fat tissue, and so it accumulates into the tissues of breast milk, and then infants that are breastfeeding get the PCBs in higher concentrations. So that is the big risk that we're looking at right now for the Willamette River, and that's a major yeah. reason we need to clean this up, yeah. because those infants that consume too much of this contaminated uh, product would suffer from brain damage, uh, developmental disabilities, and these are problems that we can prevent by cleaning up the river. Mm. And, and who, who eats fish out of the Willamette River? A lot of people do. <laughs> But yeah, but it's a lot of it's cultural, but it's, you know, a lot of people do, whether recreational, uh, um, we have a, a high population of homeless people that are transit or live or camp along the river, they, mm -hmm. that they subside off of that. Cultural people, uh, and then there's also people that just use it to supplement their, um, their diet because fish is an important part of your diet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also important mm -hmm. to recognize that, you know, when we talk about the long term with <laughs> babies and, and stuff, and we think of future generations as far as pollution, we mm -hmm. also add, in the Superfund site, we also have what we call hot spots or immediate action areas. And, and a lot of those are because they're, the level's so hot that it, it has immediate effect on us as adults even now. So we have to look at there's several different levels of cleanup mm -hmm. that we're dealing with as the Superfund project moves forward. And it's been going on since you know, we first been declared a Superfund project. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about people who are eating the fish, what we find is a lot of immigrant communities, especially those from Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia, like to catch and eat carp. Carp is a fish that they were used to catching back home, right. and they would eat it. Then they come here, they find there are carp in the Willamette, they catch them and eat them, take them home for meals, and it's, it is affecting them, it would affect them most heavily because they are relying on the carp in the Willamette more heavily than others. Now, if you see somebody launching their boat go out in the Willamette, generally they're fishing for salmon, perhaps sturgeon. Yeah. If you see somebody fishing along the bank, they are usually catching carp oh. or other similar mm -hmm. contaminated yeah. resident fish. Mm -hmm. Okay, a and carp is the one that's up here you know, getting close to 3,000 parts. Yeah. It's a highest level because it is uh -huh. kind of a bottom feeder and it's feeding more directly off the Bethnic uh, mm -hmm. community. So that Bethnic community has a higher level. It's not distributed as diverse as, you know, something that feeds in different areas. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. yeah. So s since the, uh, the, the, this portion of the Willamette River uh, has been declared a Superfund site, what progress has been made to actually doing cleanup work? Actually, quite a bit has been done. Um, we've seen it, and a lot of people that live or work along the river, especially on the west side, have seen bank, the embankment being changed as there's cleanup and been, there's been some capping and, and different cleanup methods, as mm -hmm. I mentioned before, the hotspots areas, the early cleanup. Um, you remember which areas were the first ones for early cleanup, Jim? I just slipped my mind. Well, one of the sites, and I have a, a more detailed map here that we might be able to display at some Yeah, we'll but display it. Mm -hmm. But one of the sites is one next to the railroad bridge, which we always refer to it as Arkema. And the railroad bridge, right here, 
or it's at the edge of this map, mm -hmm. but it's downriver from Swan Island, and the Arkema site is heavily contaminated. That was a site where the facility was to manufacture DDT, and next to that was also manufactured Agent Orange during the Vietnam War. Uh, DDT, of course, was banned in the early 70s, yet there is still a large plume of DDT in this area. And it breaks down into other components, but it's still DDT-related product. And that has been a heavily contaminated site that the upshore area outside of the river has had a lot of work done to it recently. So on the months. shore itself? Yeah, okay. on shore. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that work has been done recently. And so that is improving tremendously at this point. The next step, of course, will be getting the cleanup done that's in the river area itself. Now, because you mentioned that a lot of people aren't in the Portland area to watch this, the, the railroad bridge we're talking about is in St. John's area, crosses from St. John's area oh, to okay. North Portland. So it's mm -hmm. north and northwest Portland there. Yeah. And on the, on the opposite side of the railroad bridge and the opposite side of the river from Arkema is Willamette Cove. And Willamette Cove, uh, many, many people living in Portland might be familiar with it because it's now owned by Metro and with the intent of it becoming a park at some point. Right now, it is not available as a park because it is polluted. And that site during World War II was the site of a shipyards that manufactured ships and then it was also the site of a uh, what all was there a cooperage there's, there's a mill there uh, been a lot of uh, mm -hmm. for long established businesses yeah the mill there's you know which is interesting because with the lament oral history that the CAGS health sponsoring we're finding that there's a lot of people that grew up multi-generations that worked mm -hmm at mm -hmm. these places down along the river. And yeah. Willamette mm -hmm. Cove is one of those yes. important ones. Yeah, yeah I, th I think my mother worked for Coopery, so it could very well be this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. probably was. Right. Could be. Mm -hmm. And also on the other side of the railroad tracks from Willamette Cove is the, the site of McCormick and Baxter. Mm -hmm. And McCormick and Baxter was a, a creosoting plant, and it was a Superfund site of its own, which actually was one of was probably well, I guess it was the last site to actually receive funding from the federal super fund when the super fund had money in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Meaning that it was actually paid for by federal revenues instead of paid for entirely by the responsible parties. Uh -huh. And so was that site all cleaned up or well that or site partially was so partially cleaned and capped and so it's been there was a barrier wall put in around it, there was capping put on and that is still, of course, has to be watched for many centuries. And that's, and that's one of the things for people to understand is, is cleanup is kind of a subjective term because in our minds, if you don't completely remove it and deal with the, the contaminants, whether you, you're, then you're constantly storing or something. But one of the, one of the last cleanup sites, I think, um, to give an even better example of that, uh, cleanup methods has been Zydell's, where they did some cleanup. They didn't uh, armored mm -hmm. uh, capping, much like McCormick and Baxter, and they did a lot of uh, mm -hmm. bank establishing and stuff. And, and people are long-term residents and workers mm -hmm. in, uh, in the Portland Metropolitan, especially uh, blue-collar workers, which is how I grew up. Mm -hmm. Zydell's was very important for that mm -hmm. industry, and, and yeah. uh, good or bad, it created a lot of jobs. And now to see them taken and clean up there is, is interesting because mm -hmm. we've seen them establish mm -hmm the slope bank back, because we have a lot of hard banks. So a lot of the early actions, a lot of the cleanup we've seen so far is back to what we call the early actions. McCormick, Baxter, and Zydell were both in-water type processes. Arkema and several others have been what we call uh, upland. And most of those projects, even though uh, they're under EPA kind of overlook, they're the lead agency on that for mm -hmm. all the upland is uh, Oregon State Department of the Environmental Quality, DEQ. Mm -hmm. okay. They've done Zydell, some tremendous Zydell's work. actually uh, upriver further and it's it's outside of the s this study area. area yeah but okay. it's upriver further on the other side of downtown mm -hmm. the other sites that we've been talking about are within this area and one site that has had some cleanup is a site called gasco and gasco was a facility where northwest natural gas would produce natural gas from coal mm -hmm. and in that process they generated some tar materials that then leached out through the ground into the river. There was a basically a tar body on the bank of the river that had to be removed. And there were some problems with the way that was done 
in the cleanup. We had, as the <laughs> community advisory group, we had warned them to n not do a certain approach. They did it, and it didn't really work out the way they had hoped it would. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we're hoping that they keep listening to us, mm -hmm. or actually listen to us. Too. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the, the goal of the, the uh, advisory group is also look at what we call those best management practices that have been mm -hmm. exercised before now and as we work toward what we call the record of decision, which will kind of lead the lay the groundwork for cleanup, we want to see those improve some of those best management practices because we've seen some shortfalls that we think need to be addressed better. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as we learn from these areas you mentioned about cleaning up and, and things that have been done already, we hope to build from that experience. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, and so if the uh, Superfund uh, fund doesn't have money anymore, mm -hmm. uh, who's paying for all this? Well, it's we paid all for by the responsible parties, and the way that works is the initial study and the development of the, the, the investigation as well as the feasibility study that proposes how the cleanup can be done was paid for by a group of industry and government agencies who were considered uh, potentially responsible parties. That included the City of Portland and the Port of Portland, and that group paid for that work to get us to this point. There will be, there's a parallel allocation process that's going on where they will negotiate amongst themselves, all of the different potentially responsible parties, negotiate an agreement of how they're going to divvy up and pay for the cost of the cleanup. If they don't come to an agreement, then EPA takes them to court to determine how that will be paid for. So so taking them <laughs> to court doesn't sound <laughs> like, well, well I mean, that sounds like decade-long process. Well, EPA, EPA will, mm -hmm. the process of cleanup will go forward. Mm -hmm. And right. as we get to what we call allocation after record decision, it's kind of going on at the same time. When the EPA gets allocation and allocate who's responsible at what level, a lot of, a lot of companies can um, uh, opt to just pay their way and not participate in the direct cleanup. And a lot of them might opt to say, we're going to go to litigation, and then EPA can come after them with what they call, uh, I can't remember the exact term, but it's basically like triple damages. So they can say, you know, your, your bill might have been 100000 or $100 million, and we're going to triple it, and it's 300. So you either pay or play. And so I think mm -hmm. there's, we're going to see progress no matter what. It's just how we start getting there. There's going to be a lot of litigation. There's going to be a lot of what I call fur flying, mm -hmm. because uh, the mm -hmm. sad thing is, we need to get more of the smaller businesses engaged in the process because I think some of those grassroots small mom and pop businesses are going to get, get bowled over if we don't have them know what their, what their rights are, what their resources are to participate in a level that they are truly allocated to because a lot of them are smaller businesses. Their, their liability is not equal to, say, uh, steel mills or Port of Portland or, or, or um, Zydells or whoever. You know, mm -hmm. So... We need to make sure we don't lose that grassroots industry and that economy also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's interesting to note that the city of Portland has multiple roles in this process. Yeah, I was just going to ask you what the city is. <laughs> <laughs> the city is responsible for zoning along the river. They are also one of the potentially responsible parties because of activities that result in chemicals com coming into the river that come through the city sewer, sewer system and come through all of the processes that the city has developed over the years. So the city, in one way, is a responsible party. In another way, is also a watchdog of what's happening on the river and is also responsible for more public involvement in the process. So the city is in this situation of really a multiple personality because mm -hmm. on one side they're responsible, on the other side they are helping to encourage more involvement in the process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because the city of Portland is involved at that level, anybody that's a resident in the city of Portland, we're paying into this. We've paid into it, we're paying into it now yeah. as, mm -hmm. as, as a, a taxpayer for sewer and water. But yeah, I, I think there's a line on, on my yes. it says super water. Uh, yeah, right. okay, yes, right, yeah. And, and, but I don't recall that being there like eight years ago. Was no, it, it's, 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 they started right. actually allocating that more recent than that. I don't remember the actual year that they started putting that on there. Uh -huh. And of course, one of the things that will come back to the city on that, uh, positive, in a positive light, is that because the city stepped up in advance and has helped to pay for this process ahead of time, when it comes to the allocation process and all of the different 
responsible parties and the EPA work out who is responsible for paying for the actual cleanup, mm -hmm. the city will get credit for the fact that they put money into this process up front yeah. to oh, make okay. this happen. Mm -hmm. So it may result in the city actually having to pay less in the cleanup. If it turns out the city has less responsibility than other parties, then the city would get credit back, basically. Okay. Kind of like acting in good faith. Uh -huh. Right. You okay. know, along that line, as you get close to, I know we're running low on time, as your viewers watch this, I hope that if they're interested in more, or if they want to find more information, if they belong to an organization or a business group or anything, go to our website, get a hold of us, and we'll gladly come and bring resources to bring more information, answer questions, so they can help work their way through this process. Because mm -hmm. it's going to go forward, and we'd like to see everybody participate. Yeah, I, I think there's a general f lack of knowledge in the yeah. city, and it seems you know, for, for most residents and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and fee payers that, you know, about what's going on and why it has to go on in the first place and, and uh, is there any likelihood that it will actually be successful. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, having presentations on, on your part would be, would be quite beneficial. Yeah. And it's important for people to know that right now is the most important part of the process to actually be involved and have public input in, into the process. Because right now, the EPA is reviewing the proposals of the feasibility study for how the cleanup can be done. And the EPA will be making some decisions about what will work most effectively, what, how much cleanup should be done in various areas, and what should be done with that material once it's removed. One proposal, some of that material would go into a what, what, what's called a confined disposal facility <laughs> on the river, which is basically means putting it into a hole right next to the river, okay. placing it right next to the river. Uh -huh. um, the, the now, one problem with that is that it actually fills some potential habitat area, what is actually existing habitat resources area. Resources for right. the community, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And so there's a lot of problems with that proposal. But one of the issues that we need to deal with right now is that question of, what will be done with the material when it's removed from the river, and how much material gets removed from the river. Okay. The, the whole process is complex, and there's a lot uh, of yeah, scientific yeah. technology involved. Uh -huh. This summer, the EPA has a committee that will be reviewing the whole process of what's proposed for the cleanup, the technologies that are available, and what technologies should go into the cleanup proposed plan. Mm -hmm. So this summer is important for people to be watching the process okay. and seeing how that's being reviewed. Right. Okay, and you, your organization is primarily a watchdog kind of group? Is, or an advisory group. Advisory group. Under, okay. under the CERCLA law, which is the law that the government formed for Superfund cleanup, there's actually, uh, they're mandated to have a community advisory group, and that's where they're supposed to, f supposed to focus their community of outreach uh, resources to a group like us. They came to us and approached uh, the community at large, and we formed the group as part of that outreach mm -hmm. watchdog, as you call it, or advisory group. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, there's, there's, we're tied to EPA in the sense that they need to be responding to us. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so if viewers in this area wanted to be involved with this, their best avenue of doing that would be to contact your group? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And we have a website, portlandharborcag.info and they can come to the meetings, the monthly meetings, the second Wednesday of every month at the Portland, City of Portland, Bureau of Environmental Services Water Pollution Control Testing Lab, okay. which is located next to the St. John's Bridge at the bottom of Burlington Avenue. Okay. One of the things I can't stress enough is we're a grassroots group, and we are, you know, uh, involved and have been involved for over 13 years. We're always looking for opportunity to come and, and, and get engaged with people. We don't have the resources of a lot of other organizations or entities out there as far as for funding or uh, deep pockets. We mm -hmm. do it on our volunteer time, much like you do your this. Okay. And so mm -hmm. we're always looking right. for help. All right, excellent, yeah. good. Thank you very much for being here, Jim. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Great, good. So our guests today have been Jim Robinson and Robin Plants. Uh, Jim is the chair of the Portland Harbor Community Advisory Group Robin is a, the St. John's representative of that group. Uh, we've been talking about the Superfund site on the Willamette River here in Portland. Uh, learn more uh, about the site at portlandharborcag.info. 
Look out, world. The Obama administration and the 1% are about to unleash a new and more frightening version of the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA, on the world. Uh, that new agreement is called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. NAFTA is 20 years old now, and we know its record as a new public citizen report, NAFTA at 20 states. NAFTA has meant 1 million U.S. jobs lost, mass displacement and instability in Mexico, record income inequality, and scores of corporate attacks on environmental and health laws. NAFTA and other corporate trade agreements like CAFTA and the Obama enacted agreements with Panama, Colombia, and South Korea have meant a direct attack on the ability of governments to, to govern in our interest. With that record, why would we want to expand it to cover over 40% of the world's economy? Now the Obama administration has called for undermining the democratic process by asking Congress for fast-track authority. Congress is constitutionally required to regulate trade with foreign nations. Yet Obama now asked Congress to cede its responsibilities to the executive branch in order to grease the approval process through Congress for the Trans-Pacific Partnership and other such agreements now being negotiated. The time is now to say no to this latest 1% scheme. Call your U.S. representative and your two U.S. senators with this message. Do your job. Don't give it away to the president. Oppose fast-track authority for the negotiation of so-called free trade agreements. Just say no to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash populistdialogues to view most of our past shows. And when you're there, click the subscribe button so that when a new program is uploaded, you will automatically receive an email notification. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and about our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you to Roger Bates, Brad Leach, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas for their volunteer time getting us on the air. And thank you to all of you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye. If you think corporations bought free speech before, now that they're human, they'll buy even more. Yeah, their money has free speech to me, quite a shock Cause I never heard my money talk When a corporation has a colonoscopy Then I'll believe they're human like me